Okay, everybody, good morning and welcome to today's edition of English Live. So today we are going to be learning about persuasive writing techniques. And these are so useful for so many different aspects of your life, okay? They'll be great for when you're writing speeches and letters and essays and arguments in English. Um, but you can use them in your everyday life to try and persuade people to do things for you or give you things or help you with things. So uh, before we get started on the actual lesson, um, a few little reminders. So uh, if you are new to English Live, you might like to download one of these PDFs. It's a task sheet with six different tasks. This one I've scribbled all over, so I'll just pop it down 
uh, there. Uh, and they are aimed at all different learning styles and needs and, and abilities. It's not just um, gradually more difficult. So there should be something there to suit everybody to extend and consolidate your learning after this short 20, 30 minute lesson. Although I suspect we might run over today because we will have a bit of an emphasis on Bertie, my dog. And I, you will know how I carried, carried away I get talking about Bertie. So um, we always have a starter activity and that's no different today. Today I'm going to ask you to see how many words you can make from the letters found in the word persuasion. Okay, I'm going to give you about a minute and a half to do this. It's to get your brain moving. Everybody loves the starter activity and pop in the comments how many words you managed to get. Okay, off you go. Play. You can't stop believing in yourself just because somebody in your life won't believe in you. You can't stop chasing the dreams of your life just because when you know you can do it, you don't have to do it all by yourself. Let's see in the comments. Uh, Adam says 19, um, 20 so far from, oh, it's going so fast I can hardly see any of the names. Well, you've all done a really good job, so well done. A few hellos before we get started on the lesson. So hello to Noah, who is nine, to Evie, Tabitha and Carter, who are watching this these English live lessons for the first time. Welcome, welcome, and welcome to everybody who's new today. Uh, hello to Naomi, who is nine in Levington. Oh my God, the numbers going up in the chat are just insane. Everyone's saying how many words they got from Persuasion. Wow, some really high ones as well. I just saw 27. Um, happy birthday to Katrina. Happy birthday to another Holly who is watching today and her dad's off work with uh, today to celebrate her birthday with her. So I hope that you and dad and the rest of your family enjoy this lesson today. And happy birthday to Ella, who turns nine on Friday. I've had lots of messages about people having birthdays and I will try and um, give you all a shout out. Uh, so hello to Poppy and Lottie. Um, Adamson, who are enjoying the lessons, to Natasha in St. Neots, um, to everybody who is watching this on catch up that isn't participating in live chat, big hello to you, okay? 
Uh, I'm delighted that you can, can still participate after the live lessons. And um, hello to Louise Day, who loves doing the lessons. So big hello to everybody. It's lovely to have you all here today. So we are going to be looking at uh, different techniques for being persuasive in your writing. Now, um, the way we're going to do this today is we're going to talk about this, okay? This is a plinth, okay? This is the plinth that's in Trafalgar Square. And some of you, your parents may be more so, will know that uh, there are different statues placed on this plinth um, frequently. I'm not entirely sure what's on there at the moment. Um, but we're going to use this as a basis for practicing our persuasive techniques. So I'm gonna pop it up here for a moment. Now, as I introduce each different technique to you, I'm gonna give you an example of how I would use it to persuade Boris Johnson to put a statue of Bertie on the plinth. In fact, Bertie, do you wanna come and say a quick hello? Because there's lots of people that haven't met you before. I'll grab him in a moment. So um, have a quick think, who would you like to see on the plinth? Who do you think is important or inspiring or engaging or worthwhile? And it doesn't even need to be a person or an animal, it could be an object. Um, so anything that you think would be important. So I'm gonna give you just about 10 seconds to have a quick think, you can change your mind throughout the lesson. And I'm gonna go and grab Bertie so you all know who I'm talking about. Come on, come on fat so. <laughs> so this is Bertie and I will be using him as an example um, for all of the persuasive techniques. So I'm going to be trying to persuade Boris Johnson to put Bertie on the plinth. OK, right. You can get done. But good boy. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is we are going to look at list of three and alliteration. So these are two techniques that I've rolled into one because I don't want us to run out of time today. So my example is Bertie should be on the plinth because he is bold, beautiful and bonkers. Now when you list three things it really emphasizes your point and it gives strength to your point. So it's really useful when you're persuading people because you're giving them three little reasons all rolled into one sentence. And alliteration is when um, you have more than, um, you have a number of words that all start with the same letter. Gosh, I'm out of breath from picking Bertie up, he's so heavy. Uh, so here I've got bold, beautiful and bonkers. You can combine a number of persuasive features into one sentence, um, or you could do these separately. As I said, I just did them together so we don't run out of time today. So I'm gonna give you a minute or so. You can write them down or you can call them out of the screen or you can discuss them with your family and friends. Come up with an example of list of three and or alliteration about the person or thing or animal that you think should go on the plinth. Off you go. Play. <laughs>
examples were coming up in the chat. That's fabulous. And I really liked, um, Sylvie did one that was really good. And she's putting forward um, an argument to put Sherlock Holmes on the plinth. That's a great idea. You know, I'm a massive Sherlock Holmes fan. So uh, lovely idea. And lots of you are saying the NHS and key workers. And I also think that's a fabulous idea. So as we work through these tasks today, you'll be coming up with um, different persuasive techniques to try and persuade Boris Johnson to put um, that statue of your choice on the plinth. So a quick hello to Marley in London, to Sam in Barton, to Kyron in Kent, and to my brother Elliot, who is not at work today, who's tuning in to watch. So hi, Elliot, I hope you're enjoying it. So let's move on. The next thing that you can do to make your writing or your speech or your letter sound really persuasive is to include facts and figures. OK, now it might be tricky for you to find examples of this during the lesson today. If you're watching on catch up, you can always pause the lesson whilst you do it. Um, but if not, don't worry, you can always seek this out later or you can make up some just for practice. So my example here is going to be hard for you to read because there's lots of it. But I'll read it out to you. Uh, male bulldogs like Bertie can reach a weight of 30 kilograms. Originally bred to participate in the British bull baiting activities between the 13th and 19th centuries, they now have entirely different purpose. Dogs like Bertie are loving family pets living in all corners of the world. This makes Bertie a top candidate to be immortalized on the plinth, okay? So I've included facts and figures. So the figures here I've used um, 30 kilograms to talk about his weight. Um, and the years are there what, between the 13th and 19th century and some other facts. And I've also explained that now they're all across the world. So if you can include things like that in your persuasive arguments, people are a lot more likely to buy into what you're asking because you're supporting your points with facts and figures. It makes you sound like an expert. OK, so you can make up a couple now if you want, if you're going to do a practice sentence. Um, or you can quickly research some. I'm going to give you a minute just to make a few notes. OK, off you go. Play. need for you to be focusing on this so if you couldn't see it through the screen absolutely not a problem um, but hopefully you've come up with either a sentence that includes some facts and figures or you might have just listed a few facts and figures whether you've made them up for now or if you quickly research them that's absolutely fine so we've gone through um what did we do first rule of three alliteration facts and figures and now we're going to look at similes and metaphors okay so you may have done the similes and metaphor lesson with me in the first week and I do occasionally bring it up especially when I'm talking about poetry and creative writing um, but if you're not entirely sure a simile is uh, when you it's a figure of speech when you compare something to something else by saying it is like it and a metaphor is when you say it is something else okay 
So I've got two examples for you here. The first one, Bertie is like a ray of sunshine on a cloudy day. Okay, so that's my simile. And um, I'm trying to make Bertie sound really wonderful and a really good choice for going on the plinth in Trafalgar Square. And my metaphor is Bertie is a lazy lump of lard. Lard is like butter. Um, but a lovable one. So I've even actually included some alliteration in my metaphor. So I've used lots of words that start with an L to place emphasis on those words and to make the flow of the sentences sound really nice. So I would like you now to come up with either a simile or a metaphor or both for your chosen idea to go on the plinth. Are you ready? I'm gonna give you about a minute, okay? Off you go. Play. Okay, so a few shout outs for you whilst you may be finishing off your similes and metaphors. So I'm looking at all of your chat comments and I'm getting, as you know, I get the texts from my mum telling me who I should be giving shout outs to. So um, a big hello to Cara, who is 11 in Great Denham, to Leah, sorry, Leo and Drew in, Whirling, in Whirlingworth, Ernest in Clitheroe, Safa, who is 11, and to Libby in Hampshire. I'm delighted that you're all joining me for this lesson on persuasive writing today. And um, a lovely suggestion from Angelica, who says that her mum should go on the plinth because her mum is just great. Well, I, I, I kind of agree with you that mums in general should be going on the plinths because they're fabulous, aren't they? Right, so hopefully now you should have a simile and or a metaphor that will help persuade Boris Johnson to put your choice on that plinth. Now, we're going to move on to another technique. <coughs> this one I like. <laughs> if you're a waffler like me and you like talking, you, might, you may find this one comes quite natural to you. I will bring it closer in just a moment. So anecdotes, personal anecdotes. So an anecdote is a really short little story. It's like a little tidbit um, that gives a personal experience. And you can use that to support your persuasive argument. It helps the person who you're appealing to um, have a personal connection with what you're trying to persuade them. So mine says, for me, Bertie has become one of my closest companions. I miss my family and friends, but he is always there to keep me entertained and take me out for a walk. Yes, he takes me out for a walk. Uh, yesterday, he almost pulled me over into a dustbin. Uh, so that's a little personal anecdote that I would hope would give Boris Johnson some personal insight into why I think Bertie is so special and why he deserves to go on the plinth. And I've also included a little bit of humour. And humour can be used in a persuasive uh, way to relax the reader and um, to make them feel relaxed around your ideas and feel part of what you're talking about. If they're laughing along, then they're going to feel part of that. So see if you can come up with a little anecdote of why uh, the person you've, or thing that you've picked should go on the plinth. And um, I look forward to seeing some of them in the live chat. About a minute and a half for this one, because it's a bit tricky. Off you go. Okay. You 
You can't wait on their affirmation. You can't wait on their approval. You can't wait on their support. Sometimes you just gotta run and look behind you and say, everybody wants to run, run, but I can't stop running because you're not running away. Listen, listen to me, hear me. You can't stop chasing your dream just because somebody in your life will chase you. You can't stop believing in yourself just because somebody in your life will believe in you. You can't stop chasing the dreams of your life just because when you know when you do it, you're gonna have to do it all by yourself. anecdotes I'm seeing in the live chat. It's going so fast, it's really hard to keep up with. But it's great to see you all giving those personal uh, reasons and, and those little personal stories as to why your choice of person or thing should go on that plinth. So we're really starting to uh, create a bank of persuasive techniques for each of you now. A uh, quick hello to Sadie, who is nine, who's watching with her dog. And to all of you that have picked your dog to go on the plinth, or watching with your dogs is just wonderful. Everybody loves dogs, don't they? It's a great idea. Let's get the dogs on a plinth. So we're gonna move on from anecdote now. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is flattery and shaming, okay? Now I'm gonna try and clip these both up together at the same time because they go hand in hand. A bit like me and Bertie if he had hands. Okay, is this gonna work? Possibly. Okay. Um, I'll read them out and I will bring it closer uh, for you to see afterwards. So when you are trying to persuade somebody to do something, you can, um, you can try and flatter them a little bit to um, make them want to do what you're asking them to do and uh, because you've made them feel special. And the flip side of that is that you could shame people who might disagree with what you're, you're talking about. And then the person might think, well, I don't want to be like those people that you've just spoken about that are foolish or not so kind or not so clever. And the two techniques that you can use hand in hand to um, really get somebody to come around to your point of view, okay? And if you're somebody who, if you're an adult thinking, hmm, I could use this in my work emails, you can absolutely do it. You have to be very subtle, um, but it's a great way of getting what you want, okay? So uh, my examples, my example of shaming. Um, you wouldn't be so insensitive or shallow to think that a celebrity would be more worthy. Only a fool would consider something less worthy than Bertie for the plinth. So by saying that, I'm kind of giving Boris Johnson no option but to agree with me. Otherwise, he's going to be like a fool, according to this. Um, so flattery. You are clearly a person who cares about humanity and understands what people want to see on the plinth. So I know you will recognise Bertie in this way. OK, so I'm investing my belief and trust in the person that I'm trying to persuade to make them come around to my way of thinking. OK, so you can come up with two sentences. Uh, you can jot them down. Or if you're not a very quick writer and you'd prefer to talk it out, you can discuss it with the people you're watching with or just shout it out at the screen or pop it in the live chat. I'm going to give you again about I'm going to give you a minute and a half of this one because you need two uh, sentences. OK, good luck. Off you go. Play. <laughs> Thank you. 
up you can pause if you want to spend a little bit more time uh, really perfecting your shaming sentences and your flattery senses sentences so a few hellos to Daisy and Violet in Portugal who are watching with their dog um, to Tilly in Liverpool who I should say a really big thank you to because she appeared um, on the Channel 5 news last night um, alongside me but from different ends of the country uh, talking about these lessons so hello Tilly and thank you um, hello to Reese. And um, hello to Henry and George in San Diego, to Caitlin, who's in the USA, and to Victoria in Canada, who watches these on Catch Up. So I hope that you enjoy getting a little shout out today because I know you don't get the chance to participate in live chat. And um, I'd also like to say thank you to everybody that sends me lovely letters and drawings. They really make my day. And also a really big thank you to all of your parents that have been um, buying me a coffee by PayPal. Uh, it's really, really appreciated. So thank you so much for doing that. Right. Now, uh, that brings us almost to the end of the lesson but there are a few little things that you can do just to really um, make your um, appeal a bit more persuasive so one thing that you can do is use a lot of uh, pronouns so by doing that uh, for example using you um, you can really make the person feel involved in what you're talking about and you make them feel like they're partly responsible for making a really good decision so that's one thing you can do. Um, I've got a whole list of things here. Obviously, in 20, 30 minutes, there was no way we were ever going to get through all of the techniques. Um, but you can always come back to these and um, add them in if you'd like to. So there's list of three, alliteration, facts and figures, shaming, flattery, simile, metaphor. Um, those are things that we covered in the lesson today. And um, emotive words and emotive language, they're things that really make the person feel OK, and if you appeal to how someone feels, they are connected with your argument and a lot more likely to go with what you're um, trying to get them to do or to say. Uh, Humour, we spoke about exaggeration, really exaggerating things. Um, expert opinions, if you can include a quote from an expert that supports your point, that always reinforces a really strong argument. Um, repetition, logic. Oh, and rhetorical questions. Now, that's a great technique to pop on the end. Um, a rhetorical question is a question that you don't necessarily expect to be answered. So something like, don't you agree? You can pop that on the end. That's a good one. And it leaves the person thinking, hmm, maybe I should agree with them. Any rhetorical question will just leave that question lingering in their mind and um, hopefully bringing them round to your way of thinking. So we are at the end of the lesson. Bertie, are you going to come and say hello? Going to come and say goodbye? He's looking at me blankly. <laughs> I think he's unimpressed that I said he was a lazy lump of lard. Um, do, if you haven't already, go and download the PDF task sheet. There's lots of great tasks today that involve being persuasive. Um, tasks that you can do to try and get yourself a bit of extra screen time or treats or stay up a bit later and um, some really fun ones as well so advertising things using persuasive techniques and um, just really enjoy doing the task today tomorrow we've got a vocabulary stretcher so we're going to be looking at really cool words and trying to use them in the everyday to make ourselves sound smarter and um, more like an expert and uh, then Thursday, we have a key stage one to two lesson. And on Friday, we have the Spellathon. And I will post, they are already up on the internet and the Facebook group, but I will repost the spellings later today so you can all um, start practicing them for Friday. All right, Bertie, last chance. He's just staring at me. Well, you already saw him a little bit earlier on. So I'm going to play. 
let you get on with your tasks. Thanks for joining me today. Have a good afternoon. Bye.